I think that the thing that separates the successful from the not successful marketers is those who ship win and those who are either reticent to ship or inefficient at shipping end up losing. Welcome to What Gets Measured, a Ninja Cat podcast about marketing performance management, metrics, and effectiveness. Because what gets measured gets managed. I'm your host, Jake Sanders. Adam Singer is an analyst, marketing executive, musician, writer, and bond vivant. Follow him on social if you're looking for thoughts on marketing, tech, turntables, and investing. Adam's track record contains stints at small mom and pop marketing shops like Google. Experience as a director, a CMO, an account manager, columnist, editor, and analytics advocate, and it's this giant boat of a resume that floats Adam to the shores of the Ninja Cat podcast. Adam, how are you, sir? I'm well, Jacob. How are you today? Man, better now that you're here, because we're going to talk skills, and, and, and top of the heap is analyst skills. You recently wrote an article uh, entitled, Analyst Skills or Table Stakes? How to Be Dangerous with Data. It's a fan- fantastic post on Substack where you talk about how it's not enough to just have the a- analysts siloed. Everyone has to have skills, maybe with a Z. Can you summarize that piece and then speak on this concept? Yeah, I mean, it, as it stands right now, imagine hiring a pilot for your airlines who couldn't read the altimeter, right? Would you do that? This is your captain speaking. First, I'd like to welcome everyone to Flight 86. Uh, we are currently cruising at an altitude of pretty, pretty high, at an airspeed of. We're going pretty fast too. Uh, the time is noon. Probably not. So I don't know why you would have marketers or managers on your team who are equally incapable of reading the altimeter or the speedometer or any the, the gas levels, you know, budget, any of the different metrics or dashboards that are important for your marketing. We, we haven't lived in a three TV channel world for how many decades is it now? So this shouldn't be a controversial thing to say that everyone on your team needs analysts and analytic skills. It should be, obviously, like, why would you have people who don't know those things? So my my observation is that, you know, I'm actually optimistic about this one. I'm not optimistic about a lot in marketing, but from an analytics standpoint, I think, I think people get it. I think people understand conversions and revenue are more important than followers and page views, right? I think mm-hmm. people understand putting in conversion tracking and campaign tagging and making sure that you have done measurement planning and you're set up to actually capture results. And the people who aren't are going to weed themselves out and we're not going to have to work with them too much longer anyway. Well, maybe a lot of people think I know, uh, I know what I'm talking about. How, how, how briefly kind of unpack how maybe they're not reading those altimeters, right? Those dashboards aren't telling you what you think they are. What are, what are some of those common misnomers that you see marketers make? Um, I mean, Probably the worst ones are overvaluing vanity metrics or being really obsessed with high numbers in new platform du jour. So an example of that might be, you know, working with influencers on TikTok or YouTube that have, you know, millions of views of their previous videos or, you know, tons of subscribers or followers, but aren't actually going to generate any new sales for your company. And those people will tend to lean back, oh, we're building your brand, quote unquote. No, you're not. You aren't um, Nicolas Cage. You're not um, you know, Oprah Winfrey. You have no brand. You, 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 you literally have no brand. You are flicked past in someone's social feeds as entertainment and abyss distraction while they're waiting to get their you know pizza order or while they're waiting in line to buy tickets for a concert do people still do that yes, bad example yeah. <laughs> um the point being is that you know i i think like all of these you know big impressive metrics oh um you know i have a hundred million views in my tiktok videos well who cares right like right. what does that even mean for me as a brand so i think i, I think the people like it's always been the case even in the three TV channel world where people would hide behind big numbers to sell things to those who had too much budget 
or were too clueless to know what to do with their budget. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I think as marketers, it's up to us to be able to sort through the bull. And that's not to say we shouldn't experiment with doing, you know, new trials and tactics and programs. But with, with that said, you know, you proceed cautiously until proven. And you, in your article, you talk about ways that you have, uh, you, you kind of give a couple tips on how people can sharpen their analytical skills. You don't need to go to uh, analyst college. I'm freestyling here. I'm obviously analyst not, college, <laughs> I'm not, where they do the maths. But you know, you don't have to. Uh, it, you don't have to necessarily engross yourself in, uh, you know, some kind of textbook. What are some of those things that people can do on the side at their jobs in their functions that they can sharpen their data skills? Yeah, it's it's a great question. And by the way, when I was at Google, we created an analytics MOOC that is a massive open online course where you could learn about analytics direct from myself and the other Google Analytics team members. There's obviously bias there about how Google sees the world in measurement, but with that said, I think for a free course to learn directly from you know, people way smarter than me, people like Avinash and, you know, Justin Catroni that everyone knows. Um, that's a great course. Um, wow. But from the perspective of, you know, being part of a marketing or analytics team, mm -hmm. um, I have found personally that the people that are best at the job are those that started a blog in their free time. It didn't have to be about marketing or business. It could be, you know, Joe's cooking blog or, mm -hmm. you know, Tina's Instagram, you know, food page. I'm using food as an example. Sure, sure, sure. Of course, I'm getting hungry. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so, if if you if you had this project you created on your own, you built a community on your own. You had e-commerce sales. You know, maybe you were affiliate marketing partner for La Crusade, and you're you know sell you're making ten percent every pan you sell. Those are really nice pans, by the way. Um, you, you would figure out pretty quickly the tactical mix that was working for you versus. You know, someone who from building a marketing team, I, I found like a PhD is not required. Um, I was at um I was at Caesars Hotel in Vegas talking with their director of uh, BI, who I met at a poker table, by the way. And when they found out who I was and I found out who they were, they're like, Oh, do you want to get a tour of like Caesars behind the scenes, how they actually run the casino. Um, I got to see all sorts of cool wow. insidery secrets. Um, but when I was when I was on their desk, when I was at their desk, I saw a resume, and it was a woman who had a um, she had a biochemistry background. She'd like worked in all these labs, and I'm like, why are you? Why do you have a resume of someone with a biochem background? They're like, oh, she's she, these people are really good with stats, and in a casino, they on, on their BI team, they know like to the dollar and to the hour of the day what they should price their table games at, right? It's very scientific. Um, web data is not is not so scientific. I mean, you have to be really comfortable working with imperfect data. You have to be really comfortable trying things. And, and that why, right. that's why I say, you know, you don't, you don't need the PhD. I, I find the PhD people are great, but, you know, again, someone who had just built a project in their free time and, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the, um, you've seen the mid twit meme where it's like the high IQ, the low IQ and the person in the middle. Right. Um, yes. Yes. So the, the, the person, the high IQ person might've worked in the lab, the, and I'm not, let's not even use IQ, IQ, just the person on the right and the person on the left, maybe one of them worked in a lab. Maybe one of them created a site or blog or app in their free time. And then the person in the middle is the one who, you know, they they just sat in stats classes. They never got beyond the classes. So I'm not saying the classes are bad, but you have to get out there and, and you have to trial things on your own. So to your point, um, you know, if you're at a company, at, create your own sandbox project is what I like to call it, where you can experiment because it's not like you can change the tags on a website or, you know, run an AB test without, you know, permission from your team. And if you're at a big company, that's hard to do. If you're a small company, you can just do those things. Oh, oh my God. I, I love it. So start a sandbox. Is, uh, is there anything else like, and, and that's where you sharpen your analytical skills in a safe place, a skunk work. I wrote skunk work. Is that a good term too? Yeah. I mean, if, if you're already employed at a company, you know, you're selling stuff now, you don't need to be as, Scrappy. you don't need to... <laughs> be working in the, the, what we call in the investment world. You don't need to paper trade, get out there with real money and run tests. Um, nice. you know, 
Because you'll, and that's true with investing as well. You'll never do it the same way. But if you're really young and you don't have, I, I think it's a seniority thing. Um, if you're really young and you know you have some extra cycles because your team is distributed and they're not giving you enough work, that definitely create your own sandbox project, whether it's something blessed by the company or something that's not and in your own time. If you are a big company, I'm gonna guess they'll say yes if you want to try like creating a you know a fun new program. Even at Google, people on my team wanted to create for uh, Google Analytics. It, it, you could create custom reports in Google Analytics. And some people on my team were like, can we publish all the ones that Googlers made on a public mm-hmm. facing page? And the marketing team is like, absolutely. We'll build you a gallery. And we let our team publish reports that they liked. And then we let the community submit them too. And that idea came from you know a junior person on the product team. And that was a really smart idea. I, I never would have thought of that. And so, mm-hmm. but I was, you know, I was running marketing at the time. I said, absolutely, let's go. Oh my so, God. Sample, 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 sample this product. I, I, th- I think it's a brilliant idea. No, here, you didn't, I, maybe you came into marketing with an analytical appreciation. I mean, understanding numbers is one thing, but seeing the impacts that clear analytical thinking can have on strategy is a completely other thing. Like those small ideas down there, but then seeing the impacts up here at a kind of executive level. Can, can you recount like an aha moment that you had in marketing and data where you, you figured out like, oh man, it's really about the data, you know? Yeah. I, I worked for, I, I worked for an agency in Minnesota called top rank marketing and they were, they were run by direct marketers, okay. not brand marketers, direct marketers. And they had been doing direct marketing since the days of snail mailers. So it costs a lot of money to send a lot of snail mail and get response. And that's what people had to do back in the day. They also did faxes, all of these, right. you know, very, you know, boomer, yeah. boomer type <laughs> tactics. A lot of people on this call are too young to even know what a fax is, right? And so, but if you work for direct marketers, they will not spend a dollar without knowing where it's going to come back and return. And this isn't a new thing. You know, David Ogilvy has been doing this forever, right? This is not a new concept. Right. So I would suggest for young marketers, if you can spend some time working with, you know, not a SEO or social media or email shop, those things are all fine. Work for direct marketers. They know how to use all of these different, all these different tactics. And you get lots of people with all these, you know, ninja and growth hacker and whatever buzzwords. No, they're overcompensating for, you know, trying to sell higher for existing services or create fear that we need something we don't have. You probably just need to work for the right marketers. Mm. So, so thinking that that was a moment where you saw direct marketers had a finger on the data. And that was the moment where you said analysis of this stuff is what really matters. I mean, is, is that where it took off for you or? Yeah, that and um, I spent time working for both B2C and B2B brands and companies of all varying sales cycles. And I would say to really know what works, work for small companies because it's not like you're Coke and you're running ads in every potential market and you can draw whatever attribution lines you want and they'll all they'll all concurrently make sense and all concurrently not make sense, but you can always make a case for them. But right. if you're at a small company, you know where your spends are you, and, and you know what the levers are. And um, it's easier to, 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 to put together you know, your efforts, whether they're paid or organic, with results. Mm. You know, if you're a small company and new business is coming through the door, you know it's from marketing. Who, who else is telling people that your company is there? So it, it's a lot easier with, with smaller companies, with larger companies. Uh, and, and I think you have to do it at a smaller company or for yourself, you know, your own sandbox project for yourself is great because you're the only one who's done anything. So mm-hmm. you'll know pretty quick what's working and what isn't. And you can start to pattern match that to the world. And the cool thing of having your own, um, your own test area is, you know, say a, a new social network or a new, you know, product listing site comes and they want your company's money. You can quietly run little tests on, mm. you know, your own site or your own communities or your own traffic sources. And if it doesn't work for you at small scale, why would you scale up to large scale? So um, there's always opportunities to trial. And 
you know, the people wanting you to spend money might have answers. They might be good and they might be good enough for you to test, but they might not. And, you know, it's, again, it's our job as marketers to be able to understand where to, where to place our bets. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, the, the more you could just get comfortable with that, um, the more you're effective, you're going to be, whether you're at a startup or a big company. You get me thinking about go with your gut or check the data. And a lot of people are saying uh, we're over optimized on data. We got too much and you can go with your gut, but how do you make your gut smart? You need some data. So how do you kind of ride this line in between feeling and facts? <laughs> sure. Like, you no, know it's I mean? a, it's a, that's a great question. So you write music, Jacob. Yes. Okay. So all data should do for us is provide us the guide rails in which we are to come up with our creative ideas. So what does that mean? You can't, like, if I were to say to you, um, you know, write me a song, mm -hmm. you would, I, I have just given you an impossible, <laughs> infinite creative task. Uh -oh. Who knows what you'll come back to me with? Uh, yeah. Now, if I said to you, write me a jazz song at 120 beats per minute, including some saxophone, Okay, we have some parameters here. Right. And the reason that that's important is data is giving you those parameters of what the song looks like um, in such a way that will actually appeal to the your buyer persona and that person you're trying to sell to. That is all data is doing in the sense of creativity. I'm not talking about optimizing a conversion funnel. I'm not talking about you know running an A-B test. I'm actually talking about using data to inform what your brand's real creative looks like, whether that's like video creative or banner creative or social media or blog, whatever. That actual creative work, giving it guide rails is necessary. And those guide rails are informed by a lot of things and data better damn well be one of them. I don't care if you are you know the 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 sort of astrology type marketer where you know you think it's all your brilliance you think you're Steve Jobs great you're probably not Steve Jobs but um even Steve was mentally whether he realized it or not taking into account like the actual persona of 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 a Mac buyer and reinforcing that cult so with all the more tools we have you can be even better data doesn't there, there's no robot that should tell you what to do you shouldn't ever accept like automated copy suggestions from any of these tools, GP, GP3, T, yeah. whatever. Right. Deep um, neural network uh, program. Right. They can't beat, the, they can't beat the humans yet. I, I've read it. It's just, it, it, and if they can beat the humans, you need a new marketing team. So I think, I think the humans win and data helps spread our guidelines for them. Um, other, otherwise it's just, you know, you're, you're, you're not going to win and you're, you're not going to execute. You're never going to ship. You're never going to get everyone on your team to agree on what the creative looks like on the search parameters. I'm telling you, I just love that. I mean, it goes naturally into this next question because you're a cross-disciplinary uh, presence. You know, you're composing music, sharing music of you making videos, m mixing things together, you're DJing. How does creativity play into your thinking as, as a marketer? And, and I think you kind of hit on the idea that there's creativity and analytical thinking um, are together. You don't see them as opposites. Do so. Can you maybe riff a little bit more on on creativity and analysis and and how you kind of purpose per, personally approach it? Well, marketers are just pragmatic creatives. So marketers are just doing creativity with something the market values. The market doesn't value music or cinema or any any real art is not valued by the market. You can make entertainment. That's but you're you're also if you want to go into entertainment as an artist, it's not art anymore. It's you might as well you might as well sell your soul and get paid more to work in corporate America. So <laughs> anyway, it's there's it's it's not a question of you know creativity. It's if you're a marketer, you're in a creative field, so you better have some creativity. So everyone's creative then. Is that your is that your goal? No, no. There are not everyone is creative. There are many people not that that will never excel at a creative job. And the scary thing is with you know, automation of a lot of things, physical world, digital world, where we're actually like slowly like removing the creative jobs. And, and that's sad. And you know what? Um, I tell a lot of young people, hey, electrician, plumber, contractor, these are great jobs. And actually there is some creativity and, in, in, you know, uh, some parts of contracting. For sure. But, but um, like we shouldn't 
like our society, like trying to put creativity on this, like end all be all thing. They're wrong. Some of the happiest people in the world are on micro dirty jobs, doing things no one else wants to do that keeps society running. So, um, you know, plumbers save more lives than doctors. It's true. Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily agree that creativity is the end all be all, but if you want to be in marketing, certainly, you know, unless, unless you really just want to be a technical, uh, program manager setting up analytics all day, which is fine too. Um, then you, you better be creative. Ah, well, and I, I think it's maybe think about that though. I mean, you have a style when you make a song, there's, you put a little twist on it. You have a touch of craft to what you do. Can you give some advice to folks on kind of how, how you find that style or your spin? I mean, cause you, I mean, you have it, you know, how, what are, how, how can people kind of focus in on that? I, I don't know that I would advise anyone else to do that. I mean, I'm an unknown artist, so <laughs> don't, don't I don't, do I don't, what I don't, doing. Is that what there is no, there is no point to it. It's, you know, if you want to have craft, just work on something, right. It's not yeah, right. There, there's no secret, anything you're spending time on it. And so, you know, maybe because I've worked at producing music for, you know, 15 years. I don't DJ anymore, but right. Jake, I, I posted a few videos of me. It's dope. Playing on turntables. It. Well, I, 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 it's like riding a bike, you know, yeah, I don't do I it anymore, but I can. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just a factor of time spent on something. So right. um, I am glad that Jacob can hear my quote unquote style in a song. Um, yes, that it, that is, you know, something you can do as a creative to, to, to have your sort of brand and image and maybe a hundred years from now humans will recognize you know my style of work who knows mm -hmm. but today's humans don't care so <laughs> it's it's a useless skill it's for for creative but for for marketing work it it actually is useful right. to um be creative and one way that you can exercise your creative brain is to work yeah. on something that maybe has no economic value like music or yeah, making youtube videos actually people who make youtube videos probably make a lot of money for some of them right. um but yeah, it, it, if you if you exercise creativity in one form in your brain, it's like you're sort of wiring yourself for that in other forms. So. Love that. It's very simple, very simple, and and not complicated. And I, I like that disattaching it from economic value helps you. Um, it alleviates a lot of stress. I think a lot of people are saying, "Oh, is this my next thing? Is this my cupcake, food truck, taco, uh, thing?" You know, and you're like, "No." <laughs> adjust your sails and just be happy with the size of this little boat. That's just your dinghy and just, it's all good. You know, well, the crypto I, bros want to reassign financialization to creative right. digital works online, which I think is rather dystopian. Not everything needs a market attached to it. I think mm. that, you know, they are, it is very dystopian. The end result leads to, again, we talk a little bit about entertainment versus art. Well, if you're going to optimize for averages, you will inevitably arrive at what the market enjoys, which is entertainment. Art is different. Art is something the market didn't expect or want. It takes chances. It's usually valued at zero. Most of it gets discovered later. Um, it's a whole other craft. So we're not, there's no markets for art. There's markets for, you know, things people want to, you know, pump up or entertain yeah yeah so we don't need to go into this this My is God. like no not a marketing discussion well this that is, more is of the a... next that's the next podcast um but so here let's let's bring it back real fast uh just to the topic at hand if you could give one piece of advice about digital marketing analytics to the marketers out there what would it be just one piece of advice um ship i think that the thing that separates the successful from the not successful marketers is those who ship win and those who are e either reticent to ship or inefficient at shipping end up losing. So, you know, again, we talked about data being your guide rails, but it, it shouldn't get in the way of you executing. And the other thing with marketing is, yeah, we have all this data, but still at the end of the day, humans are complex creatures. You can create something that converts zero people and no one likes. And if you're in the, if you have a mindset of, oh, this is fine, we're going to, throw this aside and go on to the next thing, you're inevitably going to find winners. If you're of the mindset that, oh, we're going to spend the next two quarters doing doing an autopsy of, of what went wrong and having a million meetings about it, you're structured for the past. That's what they used to do. Cut your losers quick, let your winners run, and you know double down on the things that are working. So ship, one word. Thor.
thought log. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. I just felt like you lifting me up and I'm on top of the world. Okay. Um, how can people connect with you and find you online, Adam? Um, I'm easily stockable. So you can find me on Twitter. If you want to find me on LinkedIn, you can. I might respond. I might not. Um, and I have a Substack at adamsinger.substack.com. Again, you can just Google me too. It's pretty easy. Cheese or chocolate? We're going to play cheese or chocolate really quick. Or I'm going to ask these questions and you got to give me an oh, answer. Cheese. cheese, 100%. Whoa, hold on. Stop. Damn it, Adam. Okay, hold cheese. on. I, I'm doing it. I just have to do the intro. You know, okay. Blue cheese should be on every table instead of butter is one of my hot takes. Like spreadable blue cheese. It's we so should have put... Oh, wow. We should have started with that one. Okay, here. <laughs> let's go through cheese or chocolate. Cheese or chocolate? Cheese. Prince or Queen? Prince. B.B. King or B.B. Newworth from Fraser and Cheers? Uh, B.B. Newworth. <laughs> okay, that's going more for all. Albert Einstein or Tesla? Uh, Tesla. Okay, Nikola, um, as, as I know him. Uh, drum machine or drummer in the pocket? Drum machine. And finally, fame or fortune? Uh, fortune. No doubt. Who cares, about being, who cares about being famous? What gets measured is a Ninja Cat podcast. Please rate and review the show wherever you find your podcasts. Share this episode on social and visit us on the web at ninjacat.io.